talk a little bit about that today to start off. Uh, we'll be talking about virtual memory in class today, but I have a few quick announcements that I want to make. As you know, Professor Mutlu is out of town this week, so Yungu and I will be taking over. Um, yeah, so just a few notes. Homework 2 and Lab 2 grades will be posted soon. I actually have Homework 2 with me, and I'll be setting those out at the end of class so that you can grab yours, take a look at your grade. We'll be posting those online. I have the distributions, which I'll show right now. Um, people did really well on these. Again, this is really good. Um, it's good to see this. So a lot of people are getting within the 90 to 100% range. Um, that's great. Good for you. Um, in terms of lab two, there's a couple of uh, projects that aren't compiling. We're working to remedy that so that we can, you know, grade everything uh, and, and pass out your grades. So if you're one of those, we're working on, on fixing that. And that'll be fixed, and the grades will be posted soon. On, on these graphs, they just show, show basically for the different score bins how many students were in each category, right? OK, so if you haven't filled out the feedback form, which you should have by now, please do so. They're up here in the front of the classroom. Um, we're looking over all of them and incorporating your feedback into the future lectures. So that's really important. This week, we'll have a couple of short lectures on virtual memory by myself and Yungu. And we'll also have a recitation session for homework three and last year's midterm from this class to get you acquainted with the style of questions and what's probably going to be similar to what might be on this year's midterm. So definitely um, attend those. And speaking of the midterm, it's coming up soon, March 6th, it's a couple of weeks from now. And on this midterm, so it's going to be held during the normal class time slot, show up early. Make sure you get your favorite seat. Make sure that there's a space, a little bit of space between you and the next person. We're, it's going to be closed book, closed notes, but you'll be allowed a single 8.5 by 11 note sheet. I'm asking the professor if he wants it single-sided or double-sided, so we'll get back to you on that. But you will have a sheet for notes, a cheat sheet. Um, the thing is, we're not going to be testing you on just memorization type questions. So writing down all the key terms on the cheat sheet probably isn't going to help you that much. You have to really know the material firsthand and be able to answer those questions quickly. But the cheat sheet is there if you think that there's something that you'd like to um, remember uh, specifically for the exam. All topic covered, including that which we'll discuss this week, is fair game for the exam. This includes the lectures, the homeworks, the labs, and the required readings. So brush up on all of those if you're not that familiar on something. And look over the past midterm. This is a really great way to prepare for what you might see on this year's midterm. It's going to be a similar style of questions. The topics might change, that's for sure. But you'll get a feel for the type of questions that we're interested in having you answer. You know, things that we've talked about in some of the recitation sessions. What are the trade-offs of using this versus that? What are the pros and cons of this? If you change this assumption, how does that change bandwidth consumption or performance? We're going to ask you questions like that. And we'll go over this in the recitation session on Friday. OK, what did we learn last time? So we talked a lot about parallel computing and performing operations just in general in parallel. So we talked about data flow machines. We talked about SIMD machines. And we'll be covering more of this material, well, I guess maybe not next week, but the next time Professor Mutlu lectures. Because remember, there were still some vector machine slides that he wanted to go over. So we'll be, cover we'll be covering those eventually. But what, we'll, what we're going to be talking about today is memory. What, so, so, so let's start here. What, what is memory? As a programmer, you might have a particular view of memory. 
there's sort of this abstraction that we provide to the programmer, which is you have this big blob of memory, and the programmer, you, can send a bunch of loads and stores to memory. You give it an address, you give it some data, it's stored there, and the next time you want to read from that address, that value is there for you to read. It's a really nice, simple abstraction. So how much memory do you see as a programmer? Sixteen gigabytes? Four megabytes? I mean, you kind of see an infinite amount of memory, right, for most intents and purposes. You can just keep sending loads and stores to the whole address space, and you're able to retrieve those values from there. But here's the problem. How memory actually works is you don't have, obviously, an infinite amount. In fact, you have a very small amount, typically. And when you're sending loads and stores, they're sent to some management. We'll talk about the software side of that today, but we'll go into more detail on the hardware side in future lectures. And that management is in charge of handling the physical resources that are, man that are storing all of your data. So for example, you might have a bunch of chips fabricated in DRAM that actually store your data. And the size of that might actually just be 16 gigabytes. So how do, you, how do you provide this illusion that you have an infinite amount of memory? We're going to talk about that today. So there's this, there's this anonymously attributed quote that goes, an engineer is a man who can do for a dime what any fool can do for a dollar. So you get the spirit behind that quote, right? You can, an engineer can think of a problem in a different way and provide the illusion of more than you're actually putting into, than you can actually get from a regular system. So I'm going to provide my corollary to that, which is today we're going to see how an engineer can do with 16 gigabytes what any fool can do with a large, large, large amount of memory. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk later more about how physical memory is organized. So stay tuned for that. But for right now, let's go back to virtual memory. OK, so why virtual? What's up with this nomenclature? Why do we call it virtual memory? Well, here's a, here's a couple of ways of breaking down what we mean by virtual exactly. If you think that something's there and it's not there, it's real. Sorry, and it's there, it's real, right? So physical memory. You think that there's a chip there, it actually is there, OK, it's right there. If you think that something's not there and it really isn't there, it's non-existent. It was never there in the first place. If you think that something's not there and it is there, then it's transparent. You can't see it, but it's still residing there. And if you think that something's there and it's actually not there, it's imaginary. There's sort of this illusion that there's something there. And virtual memory is really imaginary memory. It gives the programmer the illusion that they have an infinite or nearly very, very large amount of memory when really your system has maybe 16 gigabytes. So why do we want to use virtual memory in the first place? We'll talk about all of these things. But for right now, I want you to keep in mind three really important high-level reasons why we want to use virtual memory. And we'll dive down into these. First of all, we want to use the limited amount of physical memory efficiently talk about what that means. We also want to allow the programmer to access physical memory simply, load and store interface. And also, if we're running multiple processes on the system or multiple users, we want to use physical memory safely. We want to prevent against attacks of data on data. So let's dive into these in turn, starting with using physical memory efficiently. So the idea here is that if we provide some sort of abstraction for how we're dealing with physical memory, we can get the most out of it. And one of the techniques that we use to get the most out of physical memory is something that we're going to call demand paging. So this is basically saying that we're going to have you know, some amount of physical memory, and it's going to be used to store some data that might sometimes reside on disk and might sometimes be used directly by the programmer and accessed from main memory. 
So there's this idea that we have some data that is actually in the physical memory and some data that the programmer wants to use but is currently on disk. We're going to use the small amount of memory that we have efficiently by moving data in and out of it. And the rest of that memory, the, the memory that the programmer isn't using at this moment, we can store that on disk. We can get it when we need it. It'll be there for us. But we need to manage when we move that in and out. And we'll talk about that. The idea is if we give the programmer this illusion of a huge imaginary address space, we want to use the limited amount of physical memory to hold only the very frequently accessed data, the stuff that we're using right now in our programs. And so that's how we're going to manage it. We'll put the stuff that we're going to use right away in the faster memory, DRAM. Do you remember what the stuff that we're going to use right now, what, what, it, what is the property of that stuff called? What do caches benefit from, yeah? Locality. locality, yeah. And we'll see how virtual memory leverages locality. And we just move this data back and forth as we need it. If we need something, if we demand an amount of data, we'll move it into memory. If we don't need it anymore, we'll put it back on disk. So I, I'm giving you an overview here. We'll dive into the actual mechanisms more deeply in a couple of slides. Using memory simply. As a programmer, you don't want to have to worry about how much memory you have to deal with or where everything is located in physical memory. Virtual memory can simplify memory management. The programmer can just think in terms of having this huge swath of linear addresses that it can access and load and store data to. And the operating system and hardware can actually manage how that, is, how that illusion is kept. And the processes can have the same large linear address space as well. If you start forking processes or creating copies of the same process, they can think in terms of that same large address space. So that's good. And how, do we, how, can we use virtual, how can we use physical memory safely? Well, we can protect the processes' addresses spa address spaces from one another. And this is good because it make, makes sure that the processes don't interfere with one another, able to read somebody else's data or write to somebody else's data, because they operate in different address spaces. We'll see how we do this. And user processes can't access privileged information, like passwords that are stored in some OS-protected memory, unencrypted. They can't read this, and, and we provide those guarantees. And it's kind of like file permissions, right? But now in terms of memory. Some processes can read to a, a location in memory. Some process, processes can read and write. Some processes can execute data from that memory location. So we can provide this, this, these benefits with virtual memory. So here's the overview. We'll go into each of these in detail. Demand paging for using memory efficiently, memory management, for making it simple for programmers, and protection for using it safely. I put a star on this slide, and I have a couple of slides with stars, because I think that these are really important concepts. And at least when I'm thinking of exam questions or homework questions, I'm going to focus on probably these topics first. Um, so take a look for those. OK, demand paging. I gave you the overview. Let's dive into the details. So what's the cost of maintaining this illusion of an infinite amount of memory? It doesn't come for free. If we look at the size of address spaces on modern machines, 32 bits, which really isn't even that modern, but 32 bits corresponds to roughly 4 billion bytes. That's a lot of, that's a, that's a huge address space to be, be able to provide to the programmer. 64 bits is 16 quintillion bytes even larger. Can we satisfy this, this entire address space in DRAM? Well, obviously, the answer is no. But why is that? Why, why couldn't we? What, what's keeping us from doing that? Well, the thing is, main memory technologies today are really, really expensive. The cost of around a terabyte of DRAM is in the ballpark of $10,000, give or take. But disk is actually really cheap. 
as you all know. A terabyte of disk is what? Less than $100 today. So what we want to do is we want to have disk for the data maybe that we're not using right now and use memory only for a small amount of memory for the data that we're going to use soon or are using right now. So we can use the disk to help maintain this illusion of an infinite amount of memory. So take a look at this diagram. We have disk, which is normally, we have a lot of it in our system. It's very prevalent. It's really cheap. A terabyte's about $100. If we look at what that same $100 buys you in terms of DRAM, it's a lot less, maybe only about eight gigabytes. We don't have as much of that in our systems to keep costs down. That same $100 in SRAM, we'll talk about caches a little bit in future lectures, but SRAM is fast on-chip storage. That same $100 might only get you four megabytes of SRAM. And so the problem is we want to provide this huge address space given these constraints. Okay, well, we're engineers. We can, we can work on this problem, right? As a bit of an aside before we continue, let's look at something called the memory hierarchy, which we've kind of colloquially referred to in some of the lectures. But let's look at it in a bit more depth here. So the idea is that we have a bunch of devices in this system, and we're going to move data back and forth between these devices. We're probably going to move it from the large, slow ones closer to the small, fast ones. And here's how they're organized in these systems. So we have registers, which you're familiar with by now, which is where we have 32 bits of storage, maybe 64 bits of storage that we're operating on an instruction by instruction basis. Then we have on-chip caches, which are made out of that SRAM that I just talked about, that are bigger than the registers, maybe several hundred ki kilobytes or maybe some certain number of megabytes, small number of megabytes, L1 and L2 on-chip caches. Those are on the chip. Then we have DRAM, which is the main memory. This is a lot larger than what we can store on the chip, though, as we saw, not large enough for our entire virtual address space. Then we have local storage. This, these are your disks, your flash devices. And we can think of even remote storage as part of the memory hierarchy. Maybe you have some network file system that you're accessing data, fr <clears throat> data from. Maybe you have some server that you're requesting data from. So each level stores or holds or caches data that's retrieved from the level below it. And it holds data that's displaced, that's removed or evicted from the level that's above it. And in general, and this is a really important trade-off that we have in today's systems, the smaller, faster devices tend to be more expensive, ones that we have only a few, a small amount of. As we go to the larger devices, the higher capacity ones, they tend to be slower, but they're also cheaper. This is a trade-off that we need to work with. So, in our systems, given that we have these different devices, given that we can't have an infinite amount of SRAM or DRAM, the DRAM can cache data from the disk, and the SRAM can cache data from DRAM. But here's the question. Should these two types of caches be built the same way? What do you think? Do you think you would want to build an on-chip cache the same way as you would build a DRAM cache for data from the disk that's part of the virtual address space? What are the trade-offs here? Any ideas? How are these devices different from one another? Can, uh, SRAM can have single cycle latency, whereas DRAM, if you have to hit DRAM, you're going to be out of the cycles. Yeah, so the, the latencies between these devices, the difference is huge, right? SRAM is much faster to access than DRAM. Maybe that'll shape our decisions. It will, as we'll see. Here's another point that maybe didn't come immediately to mind. Think about the initial access time for the level below these devices in the hierarchy. 
if SRAM is accessing data from DRAM, and it's accessing a big stream of data, maybe to get to that first element in the stream, it doesn't take that long. And then successive accesses are fast. Whereas in a disk, if you're accessing a stream, maybe you have to move the head in the disk to a certain location. It's a mechanical device. This takes a long amount of time in a machine. And only after that point can you start reading data quickly. That's going to affect how much data you might want to bring from each of these devices at a time. So the big difference that we touched upon was the difference in latency. So DRAM is typically 10 times slower than SRAM, but disk can be on the order of 100,000 times slower than DRAM. And another big difference that I just mentioned was that when you access sequential data on disk, the first byte, because you have to mechanically move that head to the right position, might be 100,000 times slower than the successive accesses. Compare this to about four times difference between accessing the first element and successive ones in DRAM. OK, but before we actually build up virtual memory, let's take a little bit more of a look at caches, because really virtual memory is based on the concept of caching. So we should have a good idea about how those work before we go into the function of virtual memory itself. So just to give you a high level overview, we're going to go into caches in more detail later on. But here's enough to get by for virtual memory. Just a little bit of basic terminology. In caches, we call the unit of data that they're moving around the cache, into the cache, out of the cache, a block or a line. It's just a chunk of data. Maybe it's 64 bytes. Maybe it's 4 kilobytes, something like that. And a set in a cache is a group of blocks. It's a logical group of blocks that we define. These ad types of addresses map to this group. These types of addresses map to this other group. It'll be clear why we use those later when we delve into caching. In a cache, a miss is when you look for the data, but it's not there. A hit is when you look for the data, and it is located in the cache. We want lots of hits in our caches. An insertion is when you miss in the cache, you go grab the data, and you put it into the cache. That's pretty straightforward. You put, it into, you put a block into a set. An eviction is when you want to put a block into a set, but your set is already full of other blocks. So you need to pick one of them to put back into another level of the hierarchy. You have to displace it. And some important design parameters for caches are the following. So block size. How much data do you want to bring in to the cache? Do you want to bring a really tiny amount, or do you want to bring a huge amount? This is going to de depend on the devices, and we'll talk about the decisions that were made for virtual memory. Associativity. So I mentioned that these blocks are stored in sets. You have groups of blocks. How big do you want those sets to be? If they're tiny, you might not have very many choices when you choose to evict a block. You might not have very many options to choose from. If they're really large, you have lots of options, but now you have to track all of those blocks that are in the set. Do we want our cache to be write through? When we perform a write to some data, do we actually bypass where it's located in the cache, maybe invalidating that data, and go down to a lower level in the hierarchy where it's stored? Or do we want to write back the data? Do we want to write the data to the cache and just let the natural eviction of that block propagate the changes to lower lower devices in the hierarchy. OK, so we know a little bit about caches now. Let's take what we've learned about caches and what you kind of understand about virtual memory. And let's try and figure out, for a disk cache in DRAM, how would you set these parameters? And we'll see why. So what about line size? How much data do we want to move to and from the DRAM every time we go to disk. Do we want to move like one byte? Do we want to move four megabytes? Do we want to move a large amount of data or a small amount of data? What do you think? I hear large. Why large? Because 
So one constraint might be the device that you're accessing might not even let you access a small amount of data. That's a good point. Like we talked about also, the disk has a really large initial time to seek to the data that it needs to read. So maybe we want to make the most of that and amortize the cost of moving to the first piece of data across lots of different blocks. So maybe we want to bring a lot of data in. Large is good. Disks are better for transferring larger blocks. What about associativity? When we're bringing these blocks into the cache, do we want a diversity, a diverse amount of, in, of blocks to choose from to evict? Or are we satisfied with just having a couple of options? What do you think? Is it worth tracking that extra data to figure out, these are all of my choices. I need to pick one of them. What do you think? So the thing is, every time we miss in the cache, every time our data is not located in the cache, we have to go to disk, which takes a really, really long time. And if we're not keeping data in the cache that's frequently accessed, we might be missing a lot. So when we add data to the cache, we want a large number of options in determining which data to remove. We want a bunch of options that say, hey, this data out of this big set of things, I'm actually not using that anymore. It's OK to put it back to disk. I'm not going to use it for until a long time in the future. So more information and more options here are a better thing. We'd like our DRAM cache to disk data to have high associativity. So we have a large diversity in blocks to select. What about write through versus write back? Do we want to just write? Every time we have a store, do we want to push that store to the disk? Or do we want to store it in the DRAM and then eventually write it back to disk? What do you think? Any thoughts? Remember disks? Again, disks, they take a long time to spin up to where they need to locate data. They're good when you access a large amount of data, but they're not so good when you access a really tiny amount of data. So maybe we actually want to store or coalesce a lot of those writes in the DRAM and then write them back in a big bulk operation to the disk. That might be something that we want to do in virtual memory. OK, so this is a little bit on caching and why we might design virtual memory a certain way. Let's get back to memory. So here's a system that doesn't have virtual memory. It has only a physical memory that the program can access. And some examples of this are most Cray machines. These are like big supercomputing machines, some early personal computers, and nearly all embedded systems. What it looks like is you just have physical memory, and the CPU, all of its loads and stores, are issuing physical addresses. They're actually accessing the bytes that are located on the DRAM at that offset in whichever chip it is. So they can directly access memory. This is a really big problem, as we discussed, because what happens when you want to add multiple processors or multiple users onto the system? What if you want more memory than physical memory? So these systems aren't used in most modern devices today. What is used is virtual memory, so your laptop for example, has virtual memory servers, different workstations. And in virtual memory, we have a cache, remember, for our big amount of data in the virtual address space which, space, which might be stored on disk. And the size of the data that we bring into this cache and remove from it is called a page. We have a page of virtual memory. It's basically a cache block. And what these systems look like is they employ something called address translation. This is where the hardware converts a virtual address, remember this is our imaginary huge address space, into a physical address. And it uses an OS managed lookup table called the page table. So when we perform a load and store on this machine, we're first going to look up some information in the page table, figure out is the page that I want to access in memory? If it is, 
great. I can just access it right away at really fast speeds. If it's not located in memory, it's located on disk, then we're going to have to read that from disk, put it into main memory, possibly replace something from main memory back to disk, swap some data out. We normally want to access data from main memory because it's fast. When we can't, that's bad. We miss in our cache, and that's called a page fault in virtual memory terminology. What happens with a page fault? Well, a page that you want to access is on disk, and you really want it to be in main memory right now. What this means in the underlying structures is that you looked in the page table for the entry corresponding to the page that you want to access, and it maybe has a bit that says, this page isn't located in memory right now. It's actually on disk. You need to go fetch it from this location. And the way we handle this type of operation is we call an OS routine. The OS is in charge of managing how you load data from disk into memory so that the program can then continue and access it. So the current process stops executing. Others might go on in the background whose data is located in memory. And the OS has full control over the placement of this data. It can remove certain data from memory to make room for this page, it, but it ultimately makes the decision. So on this diagram on the left, we have a view of the system before a page fault occurs. So look at what address the CPU is trying to access. It's trying to access an address that in the page table is marked as not present in memory, but on, present on disk. So what happens? We go to the OS, and we'll talk about the steps that go into this, but we go to the OS. The OS requests that data from the disk, maps it into memory, updates the page table accordingly, and then the process can resume, and it can access its data straight from memory, just as if it had if its data had been there in the first place. How we do this in the operating system is through something called direct memory access. So the processor, when, it, when a page fault is encountered, the processor communicates with the memory controller or with the data controller for the I.O. And it reads a block of data from the disk starting at a certain address. And it places that data, the system places that data within memory at where that page is supposed to be in physical memory. So this read that happens is a direct memory access. On this diagram, what's happening is basically the controller for the disks is directly initiating this transfer through this shared memory I.O. bus directly to memory. We're not reading this data into the processor and then storing it back to memory. We're storing it directly from disk to memory. This is good because this can make servicing a page fault relatively fast compared to if we had to go through the other steps. When it's done, the controller lets the operating system know, hey, I'm done copying that page for that process. And the operating system can then wake up the process that had requested that data, and it can resume. So here's a key thing. What makes virtual memory feasible for use in our systems? Why is it just not so slow that we'd rather just stick with a simple, you have this amount of physical memory in your system, and that's all you have. But hey, you don't have to worry about these page fault things and going to disk and all of this stuff. What makes virtual memory work? It's one of these reoccurring themes, right? So there's reasons why we might want to use it. What makes it relatively fast? What makes it maybe almost as good as if we just accessed physical memory directly? What property of programs might allow us to use our physical memory very efficiently? Hmm? Yeah, people are saying locality. That's right. And we keep talking about this. I want to go into a little bit more depth on exactly 
what we mean when we talk about locality. So that's right. But really, there's two things going on in the way that these programs are accessing memory in time and also in space that makes something like virtual memory really efficient. So there's something called temporal locality. We make this distinction of locality that happens within a short amount of time. This is when you want to access the same data relatively frequently in a similar amount of time. You keep accessing this same byte from this same page. Maybe you keep going back to it. It's some counter or something that you're updating. Spatial locality, on the other hand, is when you access data that's kind of nearby to a certain element. So first you access one element in memory, then you access the next one, then you access the next one. If we bring in data in a big page from disk and we access all of the bytes in that page, then we benefit from spatial locality because we brought a big space of data and we're accessing all of it within a short amount of time. That's good. Turns out applications have some of these properties in them that we can benefit, that we can leverage. Just a bit of terminology in terms of locality. There's something called the working set. This is the set of active virtual pages or active data that a program is accessing. And programs with higher temporal locality typically have smaller working sets. Why, why is this? Why is it the case that programs with high temporal locality might have small working sets? This could be a good exam question, right? Any thoughts? Think about temporal locality, what it means to have temporal locality. You're going back to the same blocks over and over and over again. If you're accessing the same set of blocks over and over, you only have time to access a small number of blocks that way if you're accessing them very frequently. So if you have high temporal locality, maybe you're just accessing a small number of blocks very heavily. So your working set size might actually be really small. If the working set is less than the size of physical memory, then that's good. We have good performance after we initially miss a few times and bring data into memory. But after that, we can just access the, the physical memory itself. If the working set, though, is greater than the size of memory, this is bad. This means that we're going to have to keep going to disk, bringing data in, and accessing it there, and replacing data. This can lead to something called thrashing, where we're just constantly copying pages in and removing them from disk. This makes our memory act as if it's basically stored in the hard disk. So we want our applications to have good locality in order and small working set sizes to benefit the most from virtual memory. OK, so we went over demand paging. Let's talk about th this is demand paging was how to use physical memory efficiently to allow this abstraction of, of a huge amount of virtual memory. So let's talk about how we can enable the programmer to use physical memory to, to use memory simply with memory management. So when managing memory, we make a couple of distinctions about how data is being accessed throughout the system. So we have the virtual and physical address space. Virtual, really big, physical, size of your DRAM on your uh, computer. And we divide these into equal sized blocks. Pages, for example. Virtual pages in virtual memory. Physical pages, or another terminology, physical frames in physical memory. And the key idea here with virtual memory and exposing it to the programmer is that each process has its own virtual address space. It has this huge sequential address space to work with. And this is great because it simplifies memory allocation. Each process doesn't have to worry about where in physical memory does my data go. You know, how much data do I actually have to work with? Where is the start of my address in physical memory? It just has this 
virtual address space where it can access and write to addresses 0 through address 2 to the 64 minus 1. That's great. And this is good for, th this is nice because a virtual page can be mapped to any physical page now. We've decoupled the actual data that the, pro pro the program is reading and writing from where it's stored in physical memory. This might reduce on fragmentation, for example, if we just allocated a big range of data in physical memory. We can move data in in page size chunks and out. And this can also simplify sharing code and data among multiple processes on the system. So let's say we have some shared OS libraries, like the C standard library, and almost all of our processes on the system are using it. We don't have to duplicate that data once for each process that's using it. We can allocate it once in virtual memory and basically point all the processors to that space in virtual memory and say, hey, you can access this page too because you're going to benefit from accessing its data. You need to access its data. That's good. So what does this look like? We might have two processes in the system. Each of them have an identical view of their virtual address space. They see addresses 0 through address n minus 1. And they have different virtual pages that are allocated in each of their address spaces. And what happens is the OS and hardware is responsible for translating those virtual pages into physical pages in memory, or maybe on disk if we run out of space in memory. So take a look at processes 0 and 1. Process 0, or process 1 and 2. Process 1 is accessing physical page 2 from virtual page 1. And it's accessing physical page 7 from virtual page 2. Process 2 is sharing physical page 7, which it's mapped as virtual page 1, with process 1. So we're sharing some data between these. And it's accessing data from physical page 10, but it's calling it virtual page 2. So we have this nice abstraction between the virtual address space and how it's mapped onto the physical address space, which can simplify the programmer and the management, the programmer's life and the management of all of this memory. So it simplifies memory allocation because now we're just sort of dealing with virtual addresses in the physical space. It simplifies sharing code and data between processes. It also simplifies something called linking and loading. Is anyone familiar with the linker in GCC? Have you ever used that before? You might have. Or maybe loading shared libraries. I don't know, at least on my workstation, I'm always like downloading new packages in order to get the shared libraries that I need for certain software to run. Virtual memory can actually help out with, with dealing with these. So in terms of linking, the nice thing is each program has this similar virtual address space. So when the compiler or linker is going through the code and generating a binary, it can just start the code, the stack. It can make assumptions about where the code starts, about where its stack starts, about where its data starts. That simplifies the compiler designers, or if you're writing in assembly, the assembly programmers life immensely. You don't have to worry about where, when it's actually run, all that data will be located in physical memory. You deal with the virtual addresses. Here's a look at one possible layout of memory. You have, this is virtual memory, remember? And you, you, know, you have kernel memory, you have the stack, you might have some type of heap where you're allocating dynamic data. You might have code data. You might have constants and other things in there. We can, we can talk about addresses on a picture like this because of virtual memory. Loading data. So maybe when we're accessing a program, and it's a huge, huge, huge program that's on disk, Maybe we don't want to bring the whole program in from disk into memory, wait while it loads data from disk, if we just want to perform some simple path through the code that does something very simple and exits. 
what we can do with virtual memory is we can just load the pages, the virtual pages, that we need to access for this particular program on demand when we access them. Start up the program, go to main. OK, let's load the virtual page that contains main. You call this function? OK, let's load the virtual page that contains this function. As we need them, we're loading them into memory. That's good, because you don't have to wait for the whole program to be read from disk. OK, so here's what we learned about in terms of management. Simplifies a bunch of things for the programmer. That's great that it's simple, right? But that doesn't really mean very much if it's not secure. If the programmer can't use this virtual memory, and every time they read their data, it's been modified by another program or something like that. So let's look how we can modify virtual memory to make things more secure. This is called protection. How do we use memory safely? <clears throat> so what are the key goals that we want to achieve by using protection with virtual memory? Well, we want to make sure that a normal user process is not able to read or write some other process's memory. This would be bad, unless they're sharing that memory. But let's assume that they're not. And you could have a malicious program that's just reading some passwords that are stored by another program. We also want to make sure that processes can't write into shared data. One process can't change printf to you know, launch the missile or something like that, right? We want to make sure that important shared data stays that way and is read-only, perhaps. How can virtual memory help here? We'll talk about these. One thing is address space isolation. Different processes have different address spaces. Another is protecting information using that page table that we already talked about. Maybe we can track a bit of extra data in there in order to help enable protection for certain pages. In addition, virtual memory can actually enable newly allocated pages to be efficiently cleared, their values set to 0. We'll take a look at how this is done. This can be helpful for en enabling security efficiently. OK, so address isolation. How does this work? And what does this, how does this affect security? Well, with address isolation, rem remember, processes can only access their virtual addresses. They have no notion of physical addresses. It's up to the OS to translate that information. And they can't just say, I want to access physical page 5 on the DRAM. They can't do that. So by going through a page table for each process that's updated only with its pages, you can actually isolate these processes from one another. Each process has its own page table. And if one process's virtual page isn't in another process's page table, it has no way of accessing it. The OS just won't let that happen. You can allocate the same virtual address as another application, as another process, but you'll end up getting a different physical page when it's eventually, when you eventually perform loads and stores on it. So the page table can help provide this isolation. So what does this enable? Well, now this means that processes can't read or write each other's data that they're not supposed to because of this isolating, because of this isolation with the page tables. Great. What about adding some information to the page table to enable more protection on top of that? So we could augment entries in the page table that correspond to a virtual page with a little bit of information that tells us something about what permissions this process might have when accessing this data. And it's up to the hardware, though, to enforce these permissions. So let's say we have a shared library file, and we don't want a process to modify it. We could, when the OS loads this shared library page into this process's virtual address, we might, the OS might say, hey, this page is read-only. I don't care if you call printf, but don't modify it. And the hardware can actually, it can set a bit that says this. And the hardware can actually enforce this at runtime. 
If, however, a program tries to access some data or write to some data or read from some data that it's not supposed to, then we have a problem. We need to handle that somehow. And the OS is called in to sort of try and figure things out. Normally, it'll just kill the program. This is called a segmentation fault. It'll send a signal that says, you tried to access something that you didn't have permissions to. That's bad. I can't give you that data. You can't continue. And the page table itself is stored by the OS in protected memory. This would break down if you could modify the page table yourself as a process. So that's stored in protected memory. That's good. OK, so that helps us prevent writing into shared libraries or in more, in more general terms, modifying pages or reading pages, writing pages that we shouldn't. What about leaked information? We haven't really talked about this too much yet. But what if you have a process that, say, allocates a virtual page, writes some secret data to that virtual page, which gets written to some physical page, and then deallocates that page? So now you have a virtual page stored in physical memory that has, this is my password, blah, written in it. And then you deallocate that page. If you use virtual memory as we've described up until this point, what will be in your physical memory? You'll have some range of bits. And within that range of bits, you'll have something that says, my password is blah. If another page, if another process is sneaky, they could go through and just keep allocating pages and freeing them, searching for passwords, searching for data that they're not supposed to read. Eventually, it's likely that they'll get allocated that page that stored the other process's password that it had freed. And then they can read those contents. So the attack vector here is that one pr so, so the whole is that if you don't do anything to memory after you deallocate it and you just leave the data there, that's bad because another process could come along and read that data. So the programmer shouldn't have to worry about this. It shouldn't be the programmer's job to zero out the contents of their data every time they deallocate a page or free a variable. That's just burdensome. But the OS can actually do this itself. The OS can make sure whenever a process frees a page, it goes through and writes zeros to the entire contents of that page. That's reasonable. But let's see how we can do this efficiently using virtual memory. Any ideas? Any thoughts on how the OS can quickly zero a page using what we've learned with virtual memory? Think about shared pages. What's up? Zegfault? Ah, yes. So for example, what the OS could do is it could have one page that just has a bunch of zeros stored in it. It could have a zero page. And whenever an application allocates a new page, you actually point it to that zero page. And you say, this is, what, this is the page that you'll start from. So this is using the concept of shared pages to actually enable this, right? If we have some all zero page and we allocate a new page, we can give them the virtual address of this zero page. And what the OS can do is the first time the process wants to modify that page, it makes a copy of it and it performs the modification. This is called copy on write. This is really efficient because now the OS doesn't have to go through and say, when I allocate a new page, Store zero to the first address. Store zero to the second address. Store zero to the third blah, blah, blah addresses. It can just point it to that page. You get the page immediately. Why is this useful? Let's say you have a program that requests a gigabyte of memory. The OS doesn't have to spend a bunch of time writing zeros to a gigabyte of memory now. OK. So going back to copy on write, basically a flag that says when you write to this page, make a new copy and then perform the update. What could this also be useful for? Yes? 
The OS gives out a page, but it's an old page that had already been set to some data. But the first time it's modified, a copy is made. Can you think of some programming type of operations that might benefit from this? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So one common thing to do in programs is you want to make a copy of a process. The system call that you can use to do that is you can fork. Basically, copy the address space and continue execution with a different process ID and some other data that's updated. What if every time you forked a process, you had to copy all of its data into different, into different physical pages or virtual pages? You'd have to wait a really long time. There's a similar thing going on here with threading. If you have a multi-threaded application and you want all of the threads to be programmed in a similar way, have sort of a common, they share a common address space for the most part, you don't want to duplicate that entire address space for all of the threads. So copy and write can help there. OK. So right now what we've been talking about is virtual memory as it exists in today's systems. Let's take a bit of a retrospective and see what were things like before virtual memory. How did we actually arrive at the way things are today? So we're going to look at three different types of scenarios. One is single user machines, really, really old machines. Base and bound registers, a very primitive way of implementing types of memory. And se a segment and address space, which is a bit of a different spin on base and bound registers. So single user machines. Life is simple on a single user machine. It's 1950-something. You're sitting in front of a huge mainframe. You have your punch card deck with you, and you're the only person using the machine. There's no operating system. It's just you programming it. You don't need protection. You don't need address translation. You know exactly what you're working with. And so you don't really need all of these different faculties if you have a single process and a single user. It's already private and it already has a uniform view of the address space because you know what the address space is that will always be given to you in your programs. And so for these type of machines, they could actually access physical memory directly. They could just think of it as that's the memory that they have to work with and perform loads and stores. If we start to introduce multitasking into the equation, things get a little bit more complicated. So, this might be on a time-sharing type system, where not only you are using this system, but you're sharing it with a bunch of other programmers in a time-shared manner. For this amount of time, your code runs. Then it switches to their code, then switches to some other code. Now we start to have some of these problems that we talked about earlier. To solve those, some early machines used something called base and bound registers. This is so, so with base and bound registers, we still have the property that each process is given a non-overlapping contiguous region of memory. So this means that one process can't write to data that's being read or written by another process. That's good. We're isolating them, and that helps provide protection. The thing is, here's the downside. All of the data that a program wanted to access had to fit within that region starting at some base and going for some length, called the bound. The way it worked was when a process was swapped in, the operating system would set a special register that corresponded to the base of the region that that process was allowed to start writing and modifying and reading from. And it also set another register for the bound, which was basically the end of physical memory where that process could read and write from, to and from. That's all you had, but it provided isolation. It was the hardware's job to check for a given access, is it within this range that the OS is allowing for this process? And if it isn't, then you'd have some mechanism similar to so, like a segmentation fault, for example. So what did this look like? Well, you have physical memory. And 
each process has its own big slice of physical memory that doesn't overlap. It's nice because it's all contiguous. You can implement a stack that counts down from a certain memory address. You can allocate data sequentially within the physical address range. The problem, though, is what if you wanted to use more than this slice that you were given? You're out of luck. This is all you have to work with. And the way that these slices would be maintained is you would just update different registers that say, this is the start of this slice, this is the end. That's all you can access hardware. Check if that's the case for this process. So I think this is obvious, but why not use this in today's machines? I mean, we want a lot of memory, right? We want a lot of memory, and this can't give us a lot of memory. Also, what's another problem here? This could lead to fragmentation in the physical memory, right? What if we have a bunch of processes on the system? Some are leaving, some are arriving, some are leaving. We might have processes that want to use more, a larger contiguous region, and we have all of the space, but it's all fragmented throughout physical memory. We can't give it one contiguous region. We could, however, give it a bunch of non-contiguous regions, which is something that virtual memory solves. An early attempt at solving the same problem was using something called a segmented address space. You can think of this as just having a list of base and bound registers for each process. So that's good. It's more flexible than, base, than just a single base and bound register. And you can think of a, a segment as a pair of base and bounds. And each process might have multiple segments attached to it. Maybe you have a segment for your code. Maybe you have a segment for your data. And early machines actually did this. They had these different segments. So what happens when you start, when, there start, when there's a different programming paradigm and you start wanting something like a stack or a heap? What do you do? Well, you add more segments. Just tack them on. Why, doesn't, why wouldn't this work in today's systems, though? Because you still have that, you, at the end of the day, you still have, first of all, some sort of fragmentation problem. You might not be able to always ag allocate a segment of the size that you would like. And second of all, it's complex for the hardware to manage all of these segments itself. Where does that complexity arise from? Well, in a segmented address space, you might have, when you request an address, you might provide a segment number or a segment ID. And the effective address in this diagram, EA, that you would like to access. And what the hardware will do is it'll look up in the segment table for that segment ID, what are the base and bound for that segment. It will apply those constraints to the effective address and check can this process, <coughs> excuse me, can this process access this effective address? If it can, good. It goes ahead and it accesses memory. If not, OK, well, you're going to have to let the, pro the process know that. This segment table could get pretty big, though, if you have a bunch of processes running on your system. And this needs to be implemented in hardware, right? So it was really a combination of all of these things, along with the flexibility provided by virtual memory that really pushed system designers to adopt that, that scheme. And so, so that's a little bit about sort of the performance isolation side. In terms of some protection, in terms of protection like we talked about for, the, for virtual memory, this was modified to allow more expression from the operating system by adding certain bits of permission to page table entries. Remember, you can only read this page. You can only execute this page. Read, write, this is shared. We can add those. And the OS is in charge of inspecting those bits and making sure that an invalid access doesn't occur. And when one does, that's when we send the segmentation fault to the, pro to the program. Oh, this is, out of, this is out of order slide showing. But we already talked about why 
you wouldn't want to use a segmented address space on today's systems. OK, so like I said, we're just going to have a couple of short lectures this week. So let's, let's summarize what we learned today. So we talked about virtual memory. We started talking about it. Gave you the high-level overview and concepts. Virtual memory is great because it allows processes to access memory efficiently through demand paging, simply by providing all of that, those memory management facilities, and safely using the protection mechanisms that we talked about. And it does this by using DRAM as a cache for portions of the virtual address space that are located on disk, because disk is a lot cheaper than DRAM. But it's designed differently from on-chip caches, and we talked about that. That was one of the star slides. How is virtual memory mapped into physical memory? That's the page table that's doing all of that. The page table is managing the mappings from virtual to physical memory. And when something isn't located in, in the physical address in DRAM, well, then we have to service a page fault, go to disk, and bring the data in. And we talked about the hardware mechanisms for doing that. What Yungu will be teaching you next time is the nitty gritty details of translating a virtual address to a physical address. How is that done in the actual hardware? You want to do that efficiently because this might be happening very frequent. This will be happening very frequently. And also, how is this data stored and managed in the on-chip caches? Do on-chip caches deal with physical addresses, virtual addresses? We'll talk about some of the trade-offs. OK, any questions on the material? OK, thanks. <laughs>